Hi everyone, I'm Christy Bird McKeeve. I'm the Executive Director of Butte Glen Medical Society and welcome to today's virtual Grand Rounds. We produce these Grand Rounds in partnership with Enlo Medical Center and uh, CME is available with a follow-up email. I just wanna remind everybody, please make sure that your audio is um, set to an appropriate level so you can hear us. Keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. Dr. Pai will be the presenter and will, I'm sure, take question and answers and she'll let you know how to best interact with her. The chat features a way to also ask questions or com make comments to the group. We are recording this presentation. It will be shared through our YouTube channel at Butte Glen Medical Society and um, available for reference later on. If you have any technical difficulties, please just log off and sign back in and that usually resolves the issue. So welcome to the virtual Grand Rounds and Dr. Sonia Pai, we're so glad to have you here today. I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can share your screen now. And I'm so glad your shirt matches your presentation. Thanks, Christy. Thank you and thanks to the Butlin Medical Society for allowing me to speak today. I'm going to speak about high-risk breast lesions. And this is, a, I would say, a very relevant topic because this is Breast Awareness Month. Uh, let me just start sharing. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, thank you. All right. So basically, I'm going to go over uh, some basic facts about breast cancer. Then we're going to talk about high-risk lesions. What are the types? What are the images, imaging findings? What is the risk of cancer with these high-risk lesions? what kind of surgeries are done for them and how to manage and follow up on them with surveillance. So breast cancer is the world's most prevalent cancer. Basically 2.3 million women are diagnosed with this new diagnosis every year, but about 7.8 million women are alive with this diagnosis and they've been diagnosed in the past five years. So it is a big global problem. In the US, we see at least a quarter million new cases every year. About 15% of all new cancer cases are breast cancer. This leads, unfortunately, to at least 43,000 deaths per year. However, there is good news that the five-year relative survival is about 90% with a diagnosis of breast cancer. The incidence rate continues to rise every year and it's estimated that it increases by about 0.5% per year. At this incident rate, about 12.9% of women born in the US today will develop breast cancer at some time during their lives. And this is a very important statistic, and this is the reason why we advocate for early and regular screening. Survival is dependent on the stage at which the diagnosis happens. The earlier the diagnosis, the more localized the disease, the uh, better the five-year survival. Almost 99% of localized stage one patients are, arrive, are alive at five years. Major risk factors for breast cancer include age, female sex, elevated BMI, and a combined hormone replacement therapy. The median age at diagnosis is 63. Usually the uh, age group of 65 to 74 is where the highest incidence of new cases occurs. Men can also get breast cancer, but they account only for about 1% of all breast cancers. So the relative risk of, for men born in the United States today, the lifetime risk of breast cancer is 0.13%, which is we lesser than that for women. And this is why most of these high-risk lesions that I will be talking about today are detected in women who have a screening program. There is no uh, organized uh, screening program for men today. However, 
most of the men who have breast cancer will have a mutation in BRCA2. BRCA1 is very rare. So every male breast cancer patient should undergo genetic testing. The other risk factors are elevated BMI. A higher BMI or perimenopausal weight gain is, leads to a higher risk of breast cancer. Combined estrogen and progesterone use also lead to a higher risk of breast cancer. These have been gone in detail by Dr. Vitlach at her previous presentation at the beginning of this month uh, for the Butlan Medical Society series. Other risk factors include genetic predisposition, early menarche and late menopause. There is a linear relationship between alcohol intake and the risk of breast cancer. Nulliparity affects it as well as family history. So then we get to screening. And this is a controversial topic because there are several different societies around the world which have different recommendations as to how frequently screening should occur, when should we start screening, and when should we stop screening. Here at Enlo and in most cancer centers around the US, we follow the NCCN guidelines. These recommend annual mammograms for women at average risk of breast cancer starting at the age of 40. Now for women who've had breast cancer or have had a genetic predisposition to breast cancer, different rules apply. The upper age limit is not yet established as to when to stop screening. You should consider whether the patient has severe comorbid conditions limiting life expectancy less than 10 years and whether therapeutic interventions are planned before advising screening. This correlates with the guidelines from the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Both societies, that is the NCCN guidelines as well as the ASBRS guidelines, recommend that women above the age of 25 should undergo a formal risk assessment for breast cancer. Early detection saves lives. Now at screening mammography, the findings are de determined and described as BIRADS category. These depend on the risk of the findings with respect to uh, cancer, benign, uh, or if it needs additional evaluation. For example, category one and category two are either completely normal or with some benign findings on imaging, and they just advocate continuing screening annually. For category zero, where there's something off and it needs additional imaging evaluation, further diagnostic workup is done. For category three, which means probably benign, and most of the lesions that I will be talking about today fall in this category, it is recommended that they at least be followed with imaging for 24 months or two years. And then if there is any uncertainty at any time on imaging, or if the patient has any other factors, you should continue with a biopsy. For category four, which is suspicious, and category five, which is highly sus suggestive of malignancy, a complete evaluation is needed, and usually a core needle biopsy is done. A core needle biopsy is the preferred initial minimally invasive way to evaluate for non-palpable breast masses or even for palpable breast masses. Usually this is a nine gauge or a 12 gauge needle, which is inserted into the area of uh, uh, concern and samples or cores of tissue are taken. Multiple cores are taken at any time, averaging from three to 12 cores. The uh, needles are placed under imaging guidance. These can be under um, stereotactic or mammographic guidance or uh, ultrasound guidance or MRI guidance. Usually once a site is biopsied, a biopsy clip is placed to mark the site in case you need to go back for any surgical excision, further vacuum assisted biopsies, or for a full fledged surgery. Sometimes we use these biopsy clips for monitoring as well. 
The results from a core needle biopsy could be benign, malignant, and borderline or high risk. We'll be talking mainly about the borderline or high risk lesions today. But the question is, are these lesions concordant? What we mean by concordance is a radiopathologic concordance. And to understand concordance, you want to understand what is discordance. Discordance is when a core needle biopsy shows benign histology, while the clinical or imaging findings are suspicious for malignancy. Usually after this discordance, we recommend repeating a core needle biopsy with either a larger gauge um, needle or sometimes a vacuum assisted device. This can be called as vacuum assisted biopsy or if it is done to take out the lesion completely, a vacuum assisted excision or VAE. Sometimes if the core needle biopsy is in an awkward area or if the patient has any ad additional findings, a surgical excision is done for a discordant result. This is important because borderline lesions are lesions that can be potentially upgraded to malignancy at a surgical excision. So having a discordant uh, report at core needle biopsy can be because there is sampling volume limitations with the small needles. And sometimes some of these lesions are very difficult to target and they may be inaccurate targeting during the core needle biopsy. Concordance is therefore important in determining whether the patient should have further surgery or just be followed clinically. So borderline lesions are also known as high-risk lesions sometimes. These terms are used interchangeably. They are lesions of uncertain malignant potential. And uh, for a consensus in Europe, they're also known as B3 lesions. Basically, this is a breast lesion that carries an increased risk for the future development of breast cancer or carries suspicion of a more sinister pathology around or in association with the lesion. There are many different borderline lesions. The lesions that I will mention today are atypical ductal hyperplasia, lobular intraepithelial neoplasia, papillary lesions, flat epithelial atypia, radial scar, mucosal-like lesions, phylloids tumors, and spindle cell lesions. Atypical ductal hyperplasia is one of the lesions which is at highest risk of malignant transformation. This is an intraductal proliferative lesion, it's similar to usual ductal hyperplasia and low-grade ECIS, and it uh, leads to an increased risk of developing breast cancer in both the affected breast as well as the contralateral breast. And we see this in a wide range of uh, patients from adolescence to old age. It's usually found on mammography as microcalcifications, mainly amorphous kinds, like the kinds that you can see uh, here. Some Sometimes these are cancers, but many times, like here, these are associated with ADH. It's seldom seen on ultrasound, and on MRI, it's basically associated with non-specific, non-mass enhancement. On pathology, atypical ductal hyperplasia is proliferation, which is restricted to one terminal ductal lobular unit of the breast, which is less than two millimeters in maximal extension. The size is important because this is what determines whether the lesion is ADH or low-grade DCIS. Otherwise, the cytologic features are indistinguishable. The rate of upgrade from ADH to ductal carcinoma in situ or invasive cancer is variable literature but is often quoted as greater than 20%. It's always recommended that these be discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting and to evaluate radiopathologic concordance and dealt with on an individual basis. In women who are diagnosed with ADH before 40, there is a lack of consensus on how to follow up these patients 
after any kind of excision. The management in Europe, uh, where they had a second international consensus conference on P3 lesions, is that it should be based on surgery and that clinical surveillance is only recommended in particular cases. Whereas in the UK, the recommendation is to continue with a vacuum assisted excision and only do surgery if there is atypia on the second vacuum assisted excision. Here in the US, most breast surgeons tend to follow the guidelines from the American Society of Breast Surgeons or ASVRS. And the recommendation is that most cases of ADH should be excised. There are some exceptions, but in most cases, ADH should be excised. Lobular neoplasia is the name given to basically atypical epithelial lesions where there is proliferation of poorly linked monomorphic cells and there is a lack of E. catherine expression. When this involves less than uh, half of a TDLU, it is called ALH. When it is more than half of a TDLU, it is called LCIS. Sometimes if you look up literature, you might also find terms such as LIN or intraepithelial lobular neoplasia. This is the WHO classification and ALH or atypical lobular hyperplasia is called LIN1. Lobular carcinoma in situ is called LIN2. And there are other non-typical variants of lobular neoplasia which include florid and pleomorphic, and these are classified as LIN3. With lobular neoplasia, the progression towards an invasive pattern is not compulsory. So it is currently classic lobular neoplasia or classic LCIS is actually considered a risk marker for breast cancer rather than a precursor. It can happen at any age, more frequently seen in premenopausal women, and it's multicentric and bilateral in a majority of the cases. It's usually seen as calcifications on mammography. Uh, this is an image of how the calcifications look on the mammogram. And once they're taken out on core needle biopsy, the specimens are radiographed, and this is how the specimens usually appear. On pathology, the Proliferative changes of LCIS result in marked expansion of the lobular units, whereas in ALH, you can still see some normal sized uh, uh, lobules with some lumina. And so this uh, particular image shows both LCIS and ALH. As the likelihood of upgrade is low, the recommendation from Europe is that these should just undergo excision with vacuum assistance and then followed up with surveillance. Uh, only the variants that are considered basically LIN3, uh, the pleomorphic and the florid kinds should undergo open surgical excision. Here in the US, we are uh, of a similar mind. The ASVRS no longer advocates a routine excision of these lesions when we have radiopathologic concordance. However, for the non-classical variants, the kinds like pleomorphic or florid, complete surgical excision is recommended. This is similar to what we do for ductal carcinoma in situ, where the excision is with a good margin. Columnar cell lesions are lesions which are characterized by enlarged terminal ductal lobular units, which are lined by columnar cells, and they have something which is called an apical snout, which is a characteristic. If there's ATP on this columnar cell lesion, it is called flat epithelial ATP. These are often found in association with other high-risk lesions or other cancers. They are considered a non-obligatory precursor of invasive cancer, they just have a very slightly increased cancer risk about one to two times compared to some of the other lesions in the list today. They're usually seen as grouped microcalcifications and many times found incidentally when biopsy is done for other reasons. 
on pathology, basically the normal luminal cells are replaced by one to three to almost five layers of columnar cells. It shows a low grade of atypia. The bridges and micropapillary formations are absent. That's why it's called flat epithelial atypia. The current guidance uh, from Europe is to just continue to monitor it. And uh, again, from the US, the ASPRS recommends observation with clinical and imaging follow-up. Some of the interesting lesions uh, that we see are complex sclerosing lesions or radial scars. These are non-palpable lesions, but on imaging, they mimic invasive carcinoma because of a stellate configuration. If it's less than 10 millimeters, it's called a radial scar. If it's called, it's called a complex sclerosing lesion, if it's greater than 10 millimeters and has more complex features. It can sometimes be caused because of localized inflammatory reaction and chronic ischemia with subsequent slow infarction. It's most commonly seen in women 30 to 60 years of age. And usually on imaging, you see a radiolucent architectural distortion which may or may not be associated with calcifications. The central portion of the radial scar is densely fibrotic and contains abundant elastin. And this is an important feature on pathology. So because the tubules at the center are compressed and the tubules further out are open, they appear like a spoke and basically give this radial scar appearance. Now here there is a difference in school of thought between European recommendations and US recommendations. In Europe, it's found that these complex sclerosing lesions or radial scars are rarely associated with ATP or DCIS. So they recommend therapeutic excision with vacuum assistance and uh, only uh, recommend surgery when you see uh, other ATP such as FEA, ADH, a lobular neoplasia along with this radial scar. Whereas in the US, we found that there is an increased risk of malignancy. Uh, the re literature reports between zero to 25%, but most of them report around 10%. So the American Society of Breast Surgeons recommends surgical excision and that only in very few cases, small adequately sampled um, lesions can be observed. Papillary lesions are lesions that are composed of papillary fronds, which are attached to the inner mammary ductal wall through a fibrovascular core and which extend into the lumen of the duct. I think this will be more um, apparent when I show you the imaging and the pathology. There are several different uh, groups of lesions and you can have papillomas without atypia, papillomas with atypia, which is uh, considered borderline, which, which is what I will be discussing today. You can also have papillomas with DCIS, which is basically considered encapsulated papillary carcinoma, and you can actually have a solid papillary carcinoma. So they basically are an inhomogeneous group of lesions. It's most frequently in women aged 30 to 50 years. It can present asymptomatically and be detected at routine breast screening, but it can also present as symptomatic as a mass or bloody nipple discharge. An intraductal papilloma is the commonest cause of a bloody nipple discharge that we see in clinic. Mammography has poor sensitivity and specificity for detecting an intraductal papilloma. An ultrasound is of much value and these can be seen as masses on ultrasound. The fibrovascular stalks can be assessed with uh, Doppler to look for vascularity. And on elastography, you can see increased stiffness of the area within the duct, and that increases the risk of uh, suspicion of malignancy. So it can be helpful in differentiating between an introductal papilloma and, uh, say, papillary carcinoma. 
An MRI is usually used to determine the extent of the disease when the diagnosis has already been established. Uh, these are sort of three examples of the lesions. You can sometimes just have like an intraductal mass. Sometimes you can have a cyst with a papilloma with a stalk. The Doppler images show the fibrovascular core. And sometimes on mammography, you can see like a big mass, but uh, on ultrasound, you can see the mass much better. This is an example of an introductal papilloma arising in a small duct. So the recommendation from Europe is that uh, a, any papillary lesion that's visible on imaging should undergo vacuum assisted extraction. And then if you can't, take out it, 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 the lesion completely by vacuum assistance, then surgery is recommended. Whereas in UK, um, the uh, recommendation is that if the papilloma has no atypia, then a vacuum assisted uh, extraction or excision is enough. Um, only do surgery if there's atypia or papillomatosis. In the US, the American Society of Breast Surgeons recommends that we should excise lesions which, which show papillary uh, characteristics on corneal biopsy if they are palpable and those with atypia. Fibroepithelial lesions contain a lot of different lesions. It involves fibroadenomas as well as phylloid tumors. Fibroadenomas are benign and do not require routine excision. Obvious phylloids tumors do require excision with negative margins, but sometimes you can have fibroepithelial lesions which are not very clearly defined, such as cellular fibroadenomas, and these can be problematic as they can potentially miss the diagnosis of a phylloids tumor. Phylloids tumors are less than 1% of all breast tumors and about two to 3% of all fibroepithelial neoplasms. They can range from being benign to borderline to clearly malignant. Only 20% of all phylloids tumors are borderline or malignant. So they are extremely rare. Phylloids tumors are characterized by a large size and sometimes rapid growth. But again, rarely they can also have a slow growth pattern. Most commonly, we see them in women aged 40 to 50 years, but in Asia, the occurrence is at 25 to 30 years. And this is how it tends to look on mammography with large hyperdense mass. On ultrasound, you can have a corresponding complex mass with sometimes with inner vascularity. And this is uh, some of the uh, histologic features. What's characteristic on histology is that there is hypercellular stroma and there are cleft-like spaces there. And these uh, features can be seen both with fibroadenomas and phylloids tumors. What determines if it's a phylloids tumor is looking at increased stromal cellularity, stromal mitosis, stromal overgrowth, fragmentation, nuclear pleomorphism, and infiltration of adipose tissue. These characteristics, they are uh, certain uh, uh, particular uh, pathologic characteristics which also determine whether the phylloids is benign, borderline, or malignant. The recommendation from Europe uh, and UK is that all phylloids tumors should undergo open surgical excision with clear margins. Uh, this is also seconded by the American Society of Breast Surgeons. A mucosal-like lesion is extremely rare, and these are lesions seen by with dilated ducts and are filled with mu mucin. They can be a precursor lesion to mucinous ductal carcinoma in situ or mucinous skull cancer, and the rate of upgrade from this mu mucosal-like lesion to cancer is quite low. They're classically seen as calcifications or, um, as, or if you're doing an MRI, they look like non-mass enhancement. 
they contain mucin and this mucin may rupture and into the surrounding tissue. The American Society of Breast Surgeons recommends that these mucosal like lesions be excised when there is atypia. Spindle cell lesions are again a spectrum of breast lesions, which include benign lesions like hemangiomas, fibromatosis, and PASH. I will be talking about these today. It also includes leomyosarcoma and spindle cell sarcoma. These are actually soft tissue tumors or soft tissue sarcomas, and we will not be discussing about them today. Hemangiomas are considered benign and we would just observe them. Uh, sometimes if the lesion enlarges, then you would consider surgical excision. Fibromatosis or derma desmoid tumors are benign but infiltrative spindle cell lesions. They are extremely rare in the breast but can be associated with trauma, prior surgery, Gardner syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis. The recommendation for this is surgical excision with wide margins because local recurrence is pretty high. PASH or pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia is a very interesting lesion. Clinically, it can present as a painless mass or as an imaging abnormality, and it's characterized by myofibroblast proliferation on pathology. It's usually seen in younger premenopausal women there is no real characteristic radiologic or exam findings, so a biopsy is needed to make the diagnosis. This is not considered cancerous or precancerous, and the recommendation is to uh, continue with clinical observation. However, these lesions can grow in size. So if there is pathology imaging discordancy, or if the lesion increases in size, you can consider surgical excision. And usually um, they are seen as big masses. Here's an example on an MRI. It can show as a non-mass like enhancement, but there is enhancement when you give contrast. And on uh, pathology, the main histologic feature is these slit like spaces in the interlobular and intralobular stroma. So, for all these high-risk lesions, what uh, determines whether we should do surgery? Basically, it's based on risk assessment, on history, clinical exam, the patient's genetics and comorbidities. So after the patient sees the surgeon, there's a discussion between the surgeon, sometimes the radiologist, and definitely always with the patient on whether to proceed with surgical excision or high-risk surveillance. Uh, this is an example of um, a mammographic finding taken out with an excisional biopsy. The commonest surgery that we do is a biolocalized excisional biopsy where a wire is placed to target the, the biopsy clip of the lesion. Sometimes if, if there's a lot of calcifications, you can bracket it by placing two wires. Once this is excised during the surgery, an intraoperative specimen x-ray is taken. This is a cup tech machine. Enlo has a cup tech machine and I use it in all of my surgeries. Post-surgery, uh, the when you take an x-ray, this is how it looks, where you can see the localizing wires, the area of interest in between. Now, there is also wire-free localizations that is up and coming. Um, these are small GPS clips uh, they can be different technologies. And this clip is placed to help find the uh, area of interest for surgical excision. A probe is used to localize these uh, clips intraoperatively. Uh, again, after the excision, a specimen radiograph is taken, and this is how it appears on the specimen radiograph. This is a technology that I'm hoping to soon bring to Chico, so please stay tuned. We will update you when we have it. The other important thing for high-risk lesions is to have a full risk assessment to assess the patient's personal risk of getting breast cancer. 
There are several models available. The Gale model is uh, also available on the uh, cancer.gov site. It's also called the BRISC model. And this takes into account the number of previous breast biopsies and diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia. But it has a limitation that it underestimates risk for women with atypical hyperplasia. The other model that is used a lot is the Tider Cusick model. This again takes into account the history of breast biopsies, but in this case, it overestimates the risk of breast cancer. So there's no perfect scoring, but we do have a few good models. Now for anyone with a diagnosis of lobular neoplasia or ADH and greater than a 20% lifetime risk, the NCCN recommends that a clinical encounter be done every six to 12 months, and this includes a full physical exam. Then it recommends an annual screening mammogram. Um, uh, this is not recommended in patients who are younger than 30, but definitely any patient over the age of 30 should have an annual screening mammogram if they've had any of these high-risk features. Consider annual breast MRI, and usually this is staggered uh, with the mammogram so that you have some sort of imaging every six months. Again, MRI is not recommended prior to the age of 25 years. In patients who cannot undergo an MRI, a contrast enhanced mammography or whole breast ultrasound may be done. The recommendation is to consider risk reduction strategies, which I will go over. And then, of course, go ahead with breast awareness. So risk reduction strategies starts with having a healthy lifestyle, basically to avoid combined estrogen and progesterone therapy if it's anticipated that the therapy will last longer than three to five years. Exercise 150 to 300 minutes of moderate physical activity per week, and then try to have some weight control. Consider risk reducing agents, which I will go over in detail in the next few slides. And then risk reducing mastectomy is only offered in individuals with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic germline mutation on genetic testing, not for these high risk lesions on their own. So risk reduction agents are usually tamoxifen, raloxifen, and aromatase inhibitors, which include exemestane and anastrozole. Tamoxifen can be given to both pre- and postmenopausal women, but only above the age of 35. Raloxifen and aromatase inhibitors are used in postmenopausal women. Tamoxifen is uh, given uh, for about five years. There is uh, no real uh, advantage to giving it beyond five years. A low dose can be considered sometimes. The average dose is 20 milligrams per day, but a lower dose can be given. Raloxifen is not uh, as efficacious as uh, tamoxifen, but it can lead to, um, uh, basically it's the drug of choice in uh, individuals with an intact uterus. Aromatase inhibitors are basically given in postmenopausal women who have significant contraindications to tamoxifen and raloxifen. They are not FDA approved for breast cancer reduction, but they have been recommended in the NCCN guidelines. So to summarize, these high-risk breast lesions are managed on a case-by-case -case basis. There is variability in imaging and pathology features for all these lesions. There is a wide range of reported upgrade rates from benign to malignant disease at the time of surgical excision for these lesions. So the recommendations after a core biopsy are that if the report is a benign lesion, then the patient should just continue with annual screening based on the patient's risk factors with the primary care provider. If the patient has a malignant diagnosis, obviously a surgical referral, preferably to a surgeon at a cancer center. If there is a, a diagnosis of a borderline or a high risk lesion, then it is strongly recommended that the patient be referred to a breast surgeon, preferably one who has completed a breast surgery fellowship. These are my references. 
thank you again to the Butte Glen Medical Society for allowing me to speak to the audience. Uh, thank you for helping us raise breast cancer awareness. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Do you have a few moments if there are questions? Yes. Okay. If anybody has questions, please unmute yourself. Okay. I think we have no questions. No questions, but wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing this insight and this will be uh, recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. You take care.